Philippians chapter number 3, we will uh, uh, look at very, very familiar verses. Uh, but I was doing some study this week, and, and the Lord just gave me this thought, and I hope it will be a help to us. I know He wants to be a help to us. Philippians chapter 3, we'll be looking at verse 13. The Apostle Paul pins these words, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. We thank you for them old songs of Zion. And Lord, uh, how you've used people over the years to pin down words to songs that minister to our hearts. And Lord, we sure do appreciate uh, the good singing tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the good testimony. Thank you, Lord, for these folks that, uh, Lord, have come out on this Wednesday night to hear from heaven. Lord, we realize many of them have worked hard, whether on their jobs or at school, and many have faced adversity this week. And Lord, they've come out tonight to find some sustenance for their soul. And so, Father, I pray you'd spread a table before us tonight and feed us with manna from heaven. I pray for the next few minutes that, uh, Lord, you'd strengthen our bodies, that, Lord, that may be weary, and, Lord, you'd certainly uh, cause our minds to be more alert and help us to not only feast on the things of God, but help us, Lord, to place those things in our hearts and our lives that might help us in the days to come or maybe in the weeks or years to come. But Lord, I pray that you'd help your people. I do pray if there be any amongst us tonight unsaved, that tonight would be the night of their salvation. But I pray for the people of God tonight. I pray that you would strengthen them, you'd encourage them, you'd edify them. Lord, you'd certainly bless them. Lord, when they leave the house of God tonight, I pray that they'd be able to say, Thank you, Lord, for helping me. And Lord, I pray you'd cause them to go out and make a difference and an impact in somebody else's life. Use this unworthy vessel. And be with those special prayer requests. Touch Miss Janet. Help little Samantha. Help others, Brother Mike and others. God, meet every need of every heart. And Lord, we certainly pray that, God, you'd be glorified in it all. Lord, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. For it's in the wonderful and glorious and holy name of the Lord Jesus, we ask it all. Amen. Amen. I told you these were very, very familiar verses. But I want you to notice, first of all, that the Apostle Paul is pinning these words down to this church at Philippi to let them know, first of all, that he is not favored. Look what he says in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He is saying that I am not elite. I am not to be put on a pedestal. I have not arrived. I have not attained anything. I really am nothing. That is what Paul is saying in this clause, in this verse. Uh, now we look back on the Apostle Paul and we think, what a man. We think, uh, 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 look at the missionary journeys that he went on. Look at the churches he planted. Uh, look at how the fact he wrote most, uh, or at least almost half of the New Testament. Uh, look how God used his life uh, there are still uh, folks being benefited, you and I included today, because uh, that God changed Paul's life on the road to Damascus, uh, that he called him, uh, and that Paul submitted himself for the honor and glory of God. Uh, but if we went back to Paul's day, we'd find out what's the big deal. This man spent as much of his ministry time in jail, in prison, as he did doing great things. I'm sure that he, even though he had a wonderful education, I'm sure if we looked at his infirmities, if we looked at uh, the effects of him being stoned, uh, the effects of him being beaten, the effects of... Uh, 
uh, him living a very, very hard, meager lifestyle, we would say uh, he's not that special. And here Paul is letting them know he's not apprehended. He is not an elite person. He is not attained anything to this point. Now, by the way, when he did go to the chopping block there at Nero's and his head was taken off his shoulders, guess what? He did attain. He has uh, received uh, the reward and is still receiving uh, fruit from his labor. But we see that he is writing to them that he has not apprehended. That is very important. What that is saying to us is we can look around in a church service and say, boy, God has blessed that person. Boy, they, that person, boy, they know a lot about the Bible. Boy, that person's really supernatural in their spirituality. And this person's this and this person that. Really, outside the grace of God, none of us are anything. Right. Right. And by the way, how you see people at church may not be how they're always living. Some people may really struggle. And when they come to church, they come to church so hungry for God, they put their best foot forward. Some people may come across as being so brilliant in the Scriptures, but you don't see how much time they put in the Scriptures to be able to get up and teach a lesson. Amen. See, you don't always see. Don't always judge a book by its cover. You never really know. Paul was trying to make us all realize we all have a lot of room for improvement. So we see that Paul is not favored. But notice what else Paul says. Notice that Paul, he's forget, he forgets. Look what he says. I have not apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Paul forgets some things. He's made it very impactful in his life that there are some things that he has to let go. Amen. Now the great apostle Paul that I gave a brief summary about just a minute ago is also the man who was guilty of having Christians murdered. He's also the man uh, who fought vehemently against the Lord's church. He's also the man... Uh, that would have snuffed out man, woman, boy, and girl who named the name of Jesus Christ. See, Paul has to live with that. Can you imagine Paul standing now and preaching to folks and maybe looking out and seeing some of the family members of somebody he had beheaded? Somebody he had stoned? Somebody he had in prison who has not been let out of prison. Now Paul is trying to preach and trying to comfort that family. And that family sitting there thinking, you're the reason they're there. Hmm? Can you imagine the skeletons in Paul's closet? Amen. Paul says, this one thing I do. He said, I haven't apprehended. He said, and by no means have I arrived. By no means am I anybody that has anything special. But one thing that I do, I've learned I've got to forget those things which are behind. He come to the point where he realized he couldn't change it. If he could, he would. If he could go back and undo all that, he would. Uh, uh, if there was uh, uh, something that he could do to make it all better, he would. Uh, but he can't. Uh, and he come to the place uh, where he learned that he had to depend on God if he was ever going to get any sleep at night. He said, I forget those things which are behind. And then notice, he not only is not favored, he forgets, but he focuses forward. Look again in verse 13. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things. Notice that's plural. There were many things he had to let go. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things, plural, there's much to be done. Reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, what helps me is I press forward. I'm focusing forward. I'm pressing forward under those things which I can control. Well, 
those things where I can make an impact, those places where I can make a difference, uh, that's where I'm going to focus, not behind. Can I say that the Lord is always wonderful, that he never requires us to give up anything, that he doesn't replace it with something. And can I say that you and I, many times, uh, we will dwell on something instead of replacing that with something that will help us in our lives. If you just sit around and pine, you will pine away. One of the worst things you can do once you retire is sit around. You're going to get stiff and go to an early grave. By the way, I know the average age of retirement is 65. Can I say they set that date when the average age people would die around 69 or 70. Now people are living into their 80s and 90s. There are people that are now living longer after they retired than they lived in the workforce. So I'm trying to tell you, boy, I can't wait to retire. You better have something else to do. Amen. Amen. Or you're going to be in trouble. And young people, based on what they're doing with Social Security and what they're doing with uh, controlling all funds and retirements and IRAs and all that kind of, you'll never get to retire. So just plan on working the rest of your life, all right? Just thought I'd be a blessing to you. Huh? But unless we find something to take the place of something that is controlling us, we will not get any help. I'll give you a prime example. You know, I'm getting old. The mind don't look, work like it once did. It wants to. But I am an expert at brain fog. That is the new term for having senior moments. You know what you want to say, but you hit a fog. And you just can't find the word that you're looking for. You ever get that point? Well, I'm getting there. And I'm finding that brain fog is becoming increasingly more prevalent in my life. So one thing I do to combat not turning out like that, I try to keep my mind exercised. Amen. I'll read challenging things throughout the day. I'll even read dictionary terms and thesaurus terms keep my mind thinking. I will do puzzles at night to keep my mind active. Because they used to say a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And uh, if you get used to brain fog, you can live there for a long time. But that don't mean that you're not going to dribble vegetable soup down your chin when they're trying to feed it to you somewhere. huh? Amen. You've got to constantly strive to better yourself. Now really, none of that's in the message. What I'm interested in is where Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. Can I say it is human nature to repine, to think back and say, Boy, if I had it all over to do, you know, do it all over again, I sure wouldn't do that. I sure would have spent my money better here. I sure would have taken better care of that. I definitely wouldn't have bought that. I sure would have rethought that. I mean, we can go on for hours, you know. We can constantly think back and easily look back and rehearse our failures. Uh, we can go back and look at our ill choices uh, and think, man, I wish I could go back. But I'm looking at this world now and I'm thinking, boy, I don't want to go back. I'd rather just be right where I'm at. Right. 
Uh, because chances are, if we could go back, we'd make the same dumb choice or we'd make other dumb choices. But we have come to the place where we've gotten a little bit of wisdom. That's called gray hair on the side of our heads, huh? But I got to thinking about this, and I, I don't know why I was thinking about this. I was just thinking back, and in Miss Judy's testimony, I was thinking about folks I used to go to church with 40, 50 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. People that uh, my family used to sing in a music group with, you know, gospel group with, and things like that. And I got to thinking about folks that I used to serve the Lord with, and, I, and some of, I don't even know if they're alive. I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're still serving the Lord. And I just got to thinking back. And as I was thinking back, and I, I just kept catching myself doing that on Monday, just thinking about folks and thinking about the ministry and thinking about, you know, boy, I wish I wouldn't have been so stupid to say that, and I wish I'd have said that a little better and stuff like that. And the Lord put this on my on my mind this verse and the Lord gave me this message this one I want to preach on for just a few minutes tonight I want to preach on turning the regrets of your yesterdays into relevant todays turning the regrets of your yesterdays into relevant todays yeah we can think back on all that stuff but if we don't use it to better today then we're not forgetting those things which are behind and pressing towards the mark. Amen. We're not reaching forward to those things we can control today. We're just sitting around on a porch wishing for a better life. Now listen, I do not believe we can control our destiny. I don't even know what that phrase means. But I do believe that we have opportunities that the Lord gives us that we can impact our todays. Every day, God gives us opportunities. Amen. And can I say that, and I've said this before, every day is like a parable. The Lord's trying to teach us something every day of our life. What we need to do is at the end of our day is kind of reflect, well, what all went on today and why did that happen and why did this happen? What's the Lord trying to show me? And I've caught myself saying, Lord, why, what are you trying to teach me out of this circumstance? And it's amazing, he'll show me. But too many times we just go through a day, go through a day, go through a day, go through a day, and we never reflect on what the Lord's trying to do in our lives. So... When thinking about all that stuff, how do we turn the regrets of our yesterdays into relevant todays? Can I say, first of all, the only way you're going to be able to go forward is you've got to own your mistakes. The Apostle Paul never shied away from where he came from and what he was and what the Lord did for him. He never ever said, well, you know, I, I, I was nothing. No, he was of the stock of Benjamin. He was circumcised the eighth day. He'll tell you that he was uh, uh, of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee as touching the law. You could not find fault in his life. Uh, he'll tell you all that he did. But then he'll also tell you there's a more excellent way. And his name is Jesus. And he would talk about the road to Damascus. And he would talk about meeting the Lord. Uh, and he would preach the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and then uh, uh, after he'd see some folks saved, uh, he'd spend a couple years with them, training them in the scriptures. Uh, so when he left, they were equipped to carry on and carry the cross forward for the Lord. Uh, but he owned his mistakes. Too many people that regret yesterday want to blame yesterday on somebody else want to blame yesterday uh, on the way they were raised blame yesterday on boy we didn't have much in the cupboard and blame yesterday uh, on this and blame yesterday on that and blame yesterday friend until you own your mistakes uh, you'll never be able to reach forward. Uh, now, I hate uh, 
that some of us may have faced some really tumultuous things in our lives. Uh, but until you embrace the fact uh, that even through that, uh, God was watching out for you. Uh, I've heard Brother Brian testify on several occasions, uh, even when he was lost, God was watching out for him. Uh, I've never heard Brother Brian uh, 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 dismiss the fact of what he was when he was lost. Uh, uh, he owns that. Uh, he realizes what he was. Uh, but but he praises the Lord even in the midst of that. Uh, God came to where he was. Uh, God saved him. God changed him. And he's not that anymore. Uh, there's too many people want to blame their past on something or somebody. And they never can go beyond it. Instead of saying, yes, this is where I was. This happened in my life. This was a horrible thing. Uh, this should have never happened to anybody. Uh, but even though it did, uh, Jesus uh, made his way known to me. Uh, and Jesus, when I called on him, he saved me. Uh, and Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Too many people don't want to own their culpability in what went on. By the way, when you was lost, you was a sinner. You had transgressed the law of God. God hated your wickedness. But even though he hated your wickedness, he still loved you. And he came to where you was, and he saved you. Hmm? But too many people want to blame all kinds of things, on all kinds of situations and circumstances. But in the bottom line of it all, Jesus could have left you lost and in that mess. Right? and could have let you die and go to hell. Amen, but he interrupted your life Amen. long enough to show you some grace. Amen. And my dear friend, he saved you. Yes. Amen. Can I say, there are folks, even after they got saved, have made some mistakes. And then they'll never reach forward because they won't own their mistake. Can I say something? The devil may, never made anybody do anything. You did it, because the devil may have presented an opportunity and you just chose to go down that path. You chose to ignore the Bible. You chose to ignore the Holy Spirit living in you. You chose to ignore all the stop signs that the Lord put in your way uh, uh, to say not to do it. Uh, and you chose to do it anyway. Uh, and you'll never uh, uh, go forward. You'll never have victory. You'll never live in the way that the Lord wants you to live and impact other people's lives uh, until you come face to face with the fact, uh, I messed up. I'm going to own this thing. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Amen. I've seen people want to blame the church, blame the preacher, blame everybody else when the problem lied right in the middle of their chest. Right. Hmm? Amen. Can I say, you'll never get past the regrets of your yesterday and be relevant in anybody's life today until you first learn to own your mistakes. Hmm? Listen, everybody makes them. If the Apostle Paul tells us he hadn't apprehended, I got news for you. There's nobody in here got a halo. We've all failed the grace of God. Amen. The difference between those that live in victory and have a victorious Christian life and those that impact other people's lives and those that don't is somewhere along the line, the people that are living victorious quit making excuses and came before the Lord and said, I am the reason. I'm at fault. It's my fault. Lord, I'm sorry. I should have listened to you, but I didn't. And when folks do that, that same grace that saves us shows up and does something in our heart that causes us to learn to forget those things which are behind and press and reach forth to those things which are before. Mm, our days can be relevant by owning our mistakes. But also, when quit living in that regretful yesterday and have relevant todays by offering our whole life to Christ. Amen. Can I say, if you're saved, you offered up 
your soul to the Lord. Yes, sir. But we're to love the Lord with our whole body, our whole mind, and our whole soul. Yes, sir. Can I say, you probably haven't given the Lord your mind if you're living in regret. Amen. You may not have given him your body if you're living in regret. Amen. You say, what do you say, preacher? Well, in your mind, all the time, you're feeling like you're a big failure. And because of that, you don't use your body to impact anybody else because you don't go out and knock on anybody's door. You don't go tell somebody about the Lord. You don't serve the Lord uh, 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 where that folks see the joy of the Lord in your life. Yeah. You just sit around and feel sorry for yourself. And you're not having relevant todays. You're having regretful yesterdays. Can I say nobody ever felt sorry for themselves and ever did anything to impact anybody else except make other people feel sorry for themselves? You see, we are written epistles, known and read of all men. So if you choose to be pitiful and a failure, people are going to see that. Or if you choose to live a victorious life, people are going to see that. Your life can be contagious either way. You are sending a message. I don't want to be, woe is me. I'd rather be, look at the lamb and what great things he's done. But you've got to offer your whole life to Christ. You've got to come before the Lord and say, Lord, you paid for my life. Lord, you bought me with a price. And Lord, you saved my soul. But I've let my mind dwell in places it shouldn't dwell, and that affects uh, me not serving you the way that I should be serving you. Lord, forgive me. Here's my whole life. Uh, help me in my infirmities. Help me in those things that terrorize me. Help me in those things that cause me to uh, uh, sit around in a, in a daze of a, a regret. And help me, Lord, to set my affections on you and help me to impact somebody else's life for your glory. Hmm? Can I say, you can have relevant today. You've got to own your mistakes. You've got to offer your whole life to Christ. But then you've also got to see the opportunities that are right before you. Look what Paul said. Paul said, But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, There are some things right before me. Those are the things I'm going to dwell on. Those are the things I'm reaching for. Those are the areas of my life I'm going to concentrate in. We've got to see the opportunities right before us. Do you ever hear the phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees? Yes, sir. Too many of us are looking for something way out there, and it's right in front of us. Listen, not, there's nobody do everything. But everybody can do something. Amen. And there's something right before you that only you can do. The Lord has something for you to do. There are opportunities right in front of you. Not everybody's got the same gifts. Not everybody's got the same abilities. Not everybody's got the same uh, 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 things that God wants to use out of your life. But he did create you for his glory, and he does have something for you to do. And there's opportunities right in front of you. Amen. I don't want to show of hands, but I wonder how many people went through a drive through this week and got a coffee or got a got a sandwich or got ticked off because what you ordered, what, what you got in the bag. Huh? And I wonder how many of those same people gave a track to those people when you gave them the money. Every time I do that, I tell them, I said, here, I got something for you to read on your lunch break. I don't want to take up their time while they're working. But I do want to give them something. And I've never had any of them say, oh, I don't want that. They're usually too busy to even really know what you're doing. But most of the time, they'll thank you. Right. And I've watched many of them put it in their back pocket. Maybe they do read it on their lunch. I don't know. But it is an opportunity right in front of me. And it's something I can do. So can you. It's not that hard. Hmm? Uh, 
I wonder if somebody's been set before you that you can pray for. That's an opportunity. Amen. I wonder if the Lord's uh, allowed uh, somebody in your life that maybe you can help out. Maybe you can give them a $20 bill or maybe you can give them some cabbage or maybe you can uh, uh, just do something for them to brighten their day. There are all kinds of opportunities right before us. You don't have to preach the Word of God. You don't have to get on a platform and sing. You don't have to teach a class. There are all kinds of opportunities for you to impact somebody else's life. But I wonder, do we ever look for them? You know what, if every morning before your feet hit the floor, if you ask the Lord, Lord, show me somebody today that I can make a difference in their life. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to open up doors after doors after doors. And by the way, he's opening up doors right now. You're just so bent on looking inward that you're not seeing the opportunities because you're too busy rest, resting on your failures of yesterday. Boy, I regret five years ago there was a testimony service and the Lord was burning something in my heart. I didn't get up and say anything and you're just sitting there beating yourself up over that and there's somebody right in front of you that you can testify to maybe on the job, maybe at class, maybe at a drive through maybe walking down the street, there's somebody you can impact their life, but you're too busy regretting that time you didn't get up testifying to church. Well, first of all, shame on you for not getting up testifying in church if the Lord told you to. Own it, ask the Lord to forgive you, and look around and see what you can do. Hmm? The Bible says there are works meet for repentance. And if you truly get right with the Lord in an area of your life, there'll be evidence that you did. There'll be some works that you're doing to show that you're not dwelling on your failure. Hmm? Huh? So many of us say, boy, I wish I, wish I would have done it, and I wish, well, you didn't. So own it, right. and get right, yes. and then look for other areas that the Lord can use you. There's all kinds of opportunities right in front of you. Hmm? Hmm? Say, how do you know that, preacher? Well, look how many people are lost in this world. Amen. Amen. Huh? Are we not in the United States of America? Right. Isn't it amazing in what has been called the greatest nation on the face of the earth? Isn't it amazing in a nation that has been called a Christian nation since its inception that the number one platform on the tickets that is being discussed more than anything else is murdering babies? That's how wicked we become. But if you and I don't stand up and speak up and say something to folks about the Lord, guess what? The next generation, that'll be a given. They won't even talk about that anymore. You do realize that any time that the devil introduces something, and any time people embrace it and say, well, we're just going to try this, that you never go back. It only gets worse. Case in point. Anybody ever hear of, well, we just want to have legal marijuana that is medical marijuana to help people in the end stages of their life to get some comfort. Medical marijuana. Hmm. Well, how come I smell it every time I walk, I'm driving with the windows down or the top down? Is there that many people dying? No, medical, because they said, oh yeah, that sounds good, becomes recreational. Right. And now all of a sudden, it's gotten so big, they say, well, you know what we need? We just need to make it legal so we can make tax dollars off of it. Always follow the money. Right. By the way, it's been Kentucky's number one cash crop for about 30 years. Whenever they started regulating who could, who could and could not grow tobacco, and they started paying people not to grow tobacco, guess what became the number one cash crop? Mm -hmm. Amen. 
what are you trying to say, people, preacher? I'm saying people are growing up to around to where they're thinking that stuff is normal. That one commercial, and, and again, I said the other day, I'm so sick and tired of Sherrod Brown and Bernie Marina. Now they got Sherrod Brown mocking, singing in a choir. Uh, I'm praying God strikes him with a lightning bolt. And then they got one for him where this, where this heifer's on there talking about she can't believe her daughter's going to be raised in a world where Bernie, Bernie Marino doesn't want any abortion at all, that her daughter won't have a choice. Well, here's the, here's the deal. Tell your daughter to be celibate till she gets married and she won't have to worry about it. You know what abortion really is? Abortion is all about you being sexually promiscuous and getting away with it. That's what it's about. It's about being a fornicator and when you get caught and there's problems, just do away with the problem. Well, there are people being raised to think that is normal. So if we don't reach people for Christ, what's it going to be like when some of us older ones are off the sea. Amen. It's not going to get any better. Amen. Now how many of you will remember this? You've got to be at least 55. We're going to make it a law to wear your seat belt, but we'll never pull you over for not wearing one. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, if Deputy Christian was here, he could tell you they can pull you over for not wearing it. And they'll write you a hefty ticket for about 135 bucks for not wearing it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We ought to all get classic cars that don't have seatbelts in them because they can't write you if it doesn't have seatbelts. You got, you, you got the grandfather clause. Huh? We all got to get a car from the 60s. You know, that wouldn't be a bad thing. No seatbelts. And no chips, so they can't tell where you're going. Right. Huh? But you see, when we was back in the 60s, we didn't think about that stuff. In the 70s, when all of a sudden the hippie generation thought they needed religion, they started having non-denominational churches, we didn't think anything. Well, that'll never take, that never catch on. Huh? And now we got crossroads with two and three thousand people sitting in them. And people are being sold a lie, being made twofold the child of hell. And my dear friends think they're doing okay. And they're going to wake up one day in hell thinking, what went wrong? Yeah. Amen. Now are we going to let them die and go to hell? Or are we going to try and impact people's lives? You'll never impact people's lives back there in the world of regret because that's exactly where the Amen. devil wants you. Amen. Amen. Be kind to those folks you work with. Share the Lord with them right. through your life and through your lips. Show them the joy of the Lord in your heart. And folks you face in this world, be kind to them except when you're in a roundabout. Miss Kay almost went to heaven tonight. Uh, they was in front of us on the roundabout, and this guy in this big, gigantic van decided he wasn't going to stop. And I haven't asked him. I don't know if it was Brother Ed that horn cussed that guy or if that guy horn cussed Brother Ed, but that guy wasn't stopping. And I was right behind Brother Ed, and I said, Bless God, he ain't doing that to my dear brother. So I got right on Brother Ed's tail, and I didn't let the guy through either. Huh? <laughs> I think it's somewhere. I've got to find it. I'm going to find it where you don't have to be good to people in a roundabout. I really do. I think that's in there. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and floor it in the roundabout. I'd have never dreamed when I was a young man started driving that one day we'd have roundabouts. But they're here to stay. So we've got to either make the best out of having roundabouts or we can sit on the porch and repine about it. Mm -hmm. Can I say we can turn those regrets of our yesterdays into relevant todays by making Christ our objective. 
Look what he said again in verse 14. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God yeah. in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know what Paul said? Paul said, you know how I deal with prison? You know how I deal with the scars of being stoned and the scars of being beaten? Do you know how I deal with all the past regrets and all that? He said, I look at Jesus. Glory. Amen. I think about Jesus. Yeah. I desire more of Jesus. Yes. I am so thankful for what Jesus has right. done in my life. Amen. Amen. Therefore, because of Jesus, I can face my yesterdays, todays, and even my tomorrows, and that's what I'm pressing for, right. Him. My dear friends, when we make Christ our objective, when we look at Him as our example, and we look at Him as our answer, and we look at Him as our hope, and we look at Him knowing that soon we will see him face to face. Amen. We don't have time to look back at our failures. If you could ever, ever, ever learn that your failure is on the, under the blood and Jesus doesn't look at it, then why in the world do you look at it? He doesn't hold it against you. Why do you? Somewhere in our minds, we've allowed the devil to convince us that because of our past failures, we're not worthy to do anything significant today. Right. Amen. And friend, if you want to live there, you can. But I would choose to live in Christ. Amen. Where I'm robed in His righteousness, I'm justified by faith, I've been forgiven, I've been cleansed, I'm blessed, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me, and I'll just choose to live in Christ. Can I say most of the time it's not the devil beating us up, it's ourselves. Amen. And we beat ourselves up because we're not looking at Jesus. Jesus is the tender, compassionate one. He's the long-suffering one. He's the forgiving one. He's the Alpha and Omega. He should be the object of our desire. And when He is, we lose all sight of self. Because once you get a glimpse of Him, you no longer matter. And then I thought about this lastly. We can turn the regrets of our yesterdays into relevant todays by just overcoming. He's already made us a priest and a king. You've heard me tell you that many times. Yeah. Revelation 1.6. He's made us a king to rule and reign over our flesh. And my dear friends, you can overcome through the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, he said in Revelation 3, he's got a special place by him. To the overcomers. When you get to heaven, wouldn't you want to be an overcomer and be right next to Jesus? Right. Yeah. Listen, I wouldn't mind being near any of you. We get to heaven, it's going to be wonderful. But can you imagine of the sea, of the throngs, of the multitudes? And yet there's going to be a few right up there by Him. Amen. Brother Adrian preached Sunday night on the cheap seats. Listen, being all the way in the last, in the back of the back of the back in heaven is going to be wonderful. Right. But can you imagine being right up next to him? Oh, yeah. Amen. That's not Amen. just reserved for the apostles, friend. Go read Revelation chapter 3. He said, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me at my throne. Amen. You can't overcome. Yeah. You say, Well, that's the people that trusted him by faith and they get to overcome. Can I say, when there's a number that no man can number, I don't think his throne's that big. Because he tells us New Jerusalem's 1,500, you know, roughly 1,500 square miles in each direction. You know what I'm saying? The throne would have to be very big for everybody to sit in his throne with him. No, that's to the ones that overcome. They overcome their flesh. They overcome their shortcomings. They overcome the devil. They overcome whatever's thrown at them. They just overcome. Everybody in here, well, if you're normal, 
couple of you I don't know about. Won't mention any names. But most people love those stories where the underdog rises to the top. Amen. Hmm? We love the stories where the, the no chance prevails. And can I say, it doesn't ever bother me who's in March Madness. I always root for the underdogs. I always root for that 15 seed to beat that 2 seed. I always root for that 16 seed to beat that 1st seed. I always root for the little guy. I really do. Huh? I do. When it comes to some of the most highly cherished movies, it's always the underdog. Rudy, he was the underdog. Uh, you go watch that movie. That don't fire you up. Hoosiers, they were the underdogs. That don't fire you up. Something's wrong. Virginia went in a game. If that don't fire you up. Uh, what can I say? When it comes about facing our flesh, our de uh, facing the devil, facing the world, guess what? We're the underdog. It, everything and all the odds are stacked against us. But you can't overcome. You can overcome all them regrets. Say, preacher, how do I overcome? Glad you asked. There's three things God has given us to overcome. First of all, he's given us the book, the scriptures. Amen. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The more you have your nose in this book, the more you're going to see Jesus, the less you're going to see of your failures. Oh, it'll show you you, but it'll show you how great God is in spite of you. And you'll find that in the scriptures, he will give you a verse. He will give you a promise. He will give you a passage. He will give you something to help you overcome. There's nothing that you will ever face in the world, in your flesh, or in the devil, that the Word of God will not cause you to prevail over. You can't overcome through the book. The reason so many don't overcome is because they don't ever get in the book. Um, we live in the information age, and we are the dumbest bunch of Christians I've ever seen. You know why? Because we listen to podcasts, but we don't read the Bible. Listen to all the good preaching you want to listen to. That'll help you. But don't let that replace your Bible reading. Because your Bible reading will do more than help you. Your Bible reading will cause you to prevail. Preaching was never to be a substitute for the Bible in your life. That's why God gave us the Bible. You're going to be many times where you don't have a preacher, but you can always have the Bible. Mm -hmm. He gave us the book to overcome. He gave us the blood of Jesus Christ to overcome. Right. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Do you realize the blood is what caused you to come out from the world? It saved you from the world. Amen. Can I say the blood is what the devil hates and any time he tries to get on your back, just start pleading the blood. Say, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't even have to say nothing to the devil. Just plead the blood. Guess what? He'll leave you alone. He hates the blood of Christ. It's defeated him every time he's ever come up against it. And can I say, even the blood, if you ask the Lord to cleanse you in his blood and to wash your mind from all the junk that you're dealing with, he'll help you. The blood Amen. will cause you to overcome. The book will cause you to overcome. And then the blessing of the Holy Ghost living in us will cause you to overcome. He that is in you will cause you to overcome anything that you face. Hmm? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The only reason you live that life of regret is because you're quenching and grieving the Holy Ghost in you. Amen. And can I say, he said, quench not the Spirit, grieve not the Holy Ghost. And when you quench and when you grieve the Holy Ghost, you are sinning against God himself. My dear friends, don't grieve him. Allow him to help you overcome. And when you overcome, 
The regrets of your yesterdays can become relevant today. As a matter of fact, a lot of those things that you went through yesterday, God may use it to impact somebody today. Amen. He might help you to be a blessing to somebody. To look at a young person and say, hey, you don't want to do this. I did that and got in trouble. Try trusting the Lord in this area. Huh? Don't make up your mind what your future is going to be. I'm going to go to this school. I'm going to become this. And I'm going to do this. Why don't you ask the Lord? Lord, show me what school. Lord, show me what area to study. Lord, send me a mate. Lord, do those things. No telling how, how much better of a life you'll have than you making the decisions. Let him make the decision for you. Huh? She's tired. Big Rev's preached too long. Come here, babe. Come here. She was peeking at me in a minute. Anyway, you want to help me? All right. What's wrong with telling young people, hey, learn in your youth to trust the Lord. Learn in your youth to depend on the Lord. Learn in your youth that you can rely on Him. Get a verse in your youth that will help you. I'm amazed, and I, I, I looked at a verse this week, and I got to thinking about this verse this week. I'm thinking, man, I remember when I memorized that when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. yes. Never, ever, ever lose sight of the power of the Scriptures. Let them control your life. Huh? Don't do stupid things, Joseph. You'll end up walking with a limp like me or walking with a cane like him. You do smart things, huh? You're a smart boy. Do smart things, huh? I appreciate all them tracks you, you hand out. You guys hand out every Monday night. I appreciate that. You'll never know this side of heaven what an impact you're making. Mm -hmm. Don't take that for granted. Keep that zeal. Right. When you're 50, keep handing them out. Right. You never know. huh? You can overcome. You can make a difference. You can be relevant today. Young people, you don't have to wait till you're old like me. You can be relevant right now. Amen. Be relevant. Yes. Don't be regretful. Be relevant. Say, preacher, I got these problems in my life. Well, at the invitation, why don't you come get it made right and go on. Amen. And yes. let Jesus use yes. you to change somebody's life. I'll never forget what Brother Neil said back in March. If we'd all win one, our church would double. Why don't we pray, God help us between now and the end of the year to win one person. Wouldn't that be amazing if we all could win one? Amen. Wouldn't that be a blessing? You can win one. Tell them one. You say one. We well, can win one. Say, so what happens if I win one? You might spark something in your heart. You might desire to win somebody else. I might desire to win somebody else. And one of them you might win, might win ten. But it all starts with just winning one. Let's make our todays relevant. Because our tomorrows depend on it. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get us all. Thank you, baby. Go to me. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we're all guilty of regretting some things and allowing that to impact us rather than looking around and seeing how we can impact somebody else. God, give us some grace. Give us a desire to just live as Christ. Help us to be relevant in this day and age we live in. Because, Lord, there are souls in the balance and souls at stake. God, oh God, there are some that really have deep, deep woes in their heart. God, help them. Lord, help them to learn to roll that over on you. And God, give them victory. Help us all to be overcomers and triumphant in Christ. 
and help us, Lord, to show a lost and dying world how great Jesus really is. Bless now this invitation. Bless these young people. Lord, bless our church. Help, folks. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.